Hi, I'm Mark Hummel. I hope you're enjoying the harmonica party and the other content that we post on our channel. Now you can become part of the show for the price of a cheap cup of coffee. Check out our Patreon page and join us for exclusive content, early releases of episodes and some rewards specifically for our Patreon friends. Thanks for helping us keep the blues alive. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. This is Mark Hummel, and this is Mark Hummel's Harmonica Party. And I have a couple guests today. I have uh, somebody that I met years ago, Barry Melton, Barry the Fish Melton. And this is his friend Natalie Martell, and they work together some. And so we're going to just talk about uh, pretty much the scene from the 60s on. Oh, okay. Yeah. And talk about uh, your exploits and I don't have any what exploits. you both have been doing lately yeah. and, and the whole thing. So, yeah, I should uh, I should start by saying I met Barry. I think in about nineteen, I want to say it was about eighty three, and I went to see you at your your uh, law offices on Market Street when you were doing entertainment law a little bit. And I like the story. Uh, I brought over a 20-page contract from Ed Denson from Kicking Mule Records. And I showed it to you and I said, what do you think? He said, you know, this is my old manager. And you looked at it and you said, I would never sign this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, you saved me some headache, I'm sure. Ed, Ed actually has remained a friend throughout all the years. That's one. I mean, you know, he's he's a dear friend. Yeah. Uh, there are guys in that band that I, well, no, I mean, I got along with everyone except Joe. <laughs> but that's okay. He's a grump. Well, you guys were in a movie together, I remember. Oh, several, was, several, actually. What was, what was the movie where you played Outlaws? Zachariah. Zachariah, yes. Yep. Hilarious. That is a funny movie. Yeah, and that, pretty, yeah. Was that Don Johnson? It was. Don Johnson and John Rubenstein, who was Arthur Rubenstein's son. Wow. Yeah. You know, the script was written by the Firesign Theater. Was it really? Yep. Yeah, I believe it. <laughs> Too much. So. And I think, uh, uh, El was it Elvin Jones that was in that? Elvin Jones played the bad guy. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there were other people who were in the movie uh, who were stars at the time, I suppose. Doug Kershaw was in the movie. Right. I don't know if you remember him. I he do. Was a Cajun fiddle player. Right. Yeah, he's Canadian. The Raging Cajun. Yeah. Yeah. He was actually Canadian. Was he? Pretty sure. Yeah. The James Gang was in too. Yes, you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Yep. Before uh, before uh, the Eagles. Correct. So we should just kind of go back and and revisit uh, how you started in music because you said you started playing guitar. In Brooklyn when you were five, is that right? It's true. Uh, my parents were very left-wing. And as a consequence, they knew lots of folk singers. Uh, uh, people like, well, I remember Paul Robeson as a, as a child. He wasn't really a folk wow. singer. He was really a classical opera singer, but mm -hmm. uh, he was pretty wonderful. Uh, and... Of course, they knew Woody Guthrie were neighbors. Wow. Uh, and I went to Marjorie Guthrie's dance school, when yeah, I was, that, which was Woody's wife. Uh, so I'm kind of a product of the folk music scene of the 50s. Right. Uh, and learned how to play guitar at that time in my life. My first guitar teacher... Uh, was a principal violinist with the New York Philharmonic. And he had me hold my hand. I'm, I'm doing this. He had me hold my hand in, in, a, in a violin grip uh, and, uh, and, and uh, taught me to sight read music on the guitar. That's amazing. Um, so. Hi, and you were, by the way, this sound that we're hearing is uh, Cleo, who is contributing commentary here. She is. <laughs> Cleo. She's good. 
She's a good girl. Yep. And so uh, you would, who was, who was the first performer you remember seeing as a kid? Uh, well, I, I re remember Woody and I've known Jack Elliott uh, for 70 years. <laughs> Cleo's taking well, issue with it. <laughs> I have, Cleo, it's true. You know, you behave yourself. Jack's yeah. pre-Cleo. I've known Jack Elliott virtually forever. Wow. Um, and when we get together, of course, he does most of the talking because he's rambling. Right. <laughs> Jack Elliott. He's still rambling. Yeah. Yeah. But um, when we get together, we talk about uh, Brooklyn and where we lived. Right. Uh, and we lived in a place called Beach Haven. Uh, which was near Brighton Beach. Stop that! <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it's okay. Oh, you lived in a place called you. Beach Haven, and Jack always called it Bitch Haven. Bitch Haven. Because of the women who lived there. Ah, uh, you know, okay. Which he remembers. Jack Elliott and Woody were the first musicians that you saw? Well, I mean, I didn't... So they performed. My mom gave Jack Elliott probably one of his first jobs, singing... For the Brighton Beach PTA, ah. uh, you know, which I vaguely remember. I, I vaguely remember him as a kid because he hung out at Woody's house, right? Uh, and I mean, but this is really going back. I mean, yeah, you know, I wasn't that old uh, seventy years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But I remember Jack. Uh, so you know, and I'm a child of that New York folk music scene. Um, and my parents, my dad was one of Paul Robeson's guards at Peekskill, which was a famous wow. riot in the, uh, I w must have been one or two years old, hmm. so I don't remember it, but um, my, my dad and uh, Woody were friends, really good friends. No, was Woody ill when, when you knew him or? Was well, no, before? not at that point in time. Later on, we moved to Los Angeles in 1955. Okay. I was eight. And Woody followed within a year or two of us moving to L.A. Woody moved to L.A. Okay. And lived in Topanga Canyon. Right. And he found a new woman to shack up with. But that's when he started getting really sick. That's when he got Huntington's career. Well, he probably had it before then. Hereditarily, but yeah, um, and I'm still close with the uh, well, not terribly close because we haven't talked in a long time with Jody Guthrie. Oh, who's okay, Woody's youngest son, right? Is that the one Joe Joe McDonald did an album on? Yes, yeah, I have that. Album. And um, and um, and he lives in the East Bay, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, he does. Uh, and he, he's a wonderful person, Jody. Uh, and um, Arlo and I are like right about the same age. I think I went to kindergarten with him. I'm not entirely sure. Now, who is that? Arlo Guthrie. Oh, Arlo. Okay, right, right. So, what a trip! So he was he was growing up in Brooklyn as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Wow. Of course. Okay. We all were. Yeah. And the Nora, who's the oldest sister, Nora Guthrie, right, uh, of the two boys, uh, Arlo and Jody. Uh, Nora was a friend of my brother's, so uh, and I kind of remember her too. And later on, I did some legal work for Jody and uh, and spoke with Nora. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, go right. back with the, uh, my family goes back with the Guthrie family. Sounds like it, yeah, big time. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's interesting because both you and Joe have that in common of having the left wing parents. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's probably some part of the reason why we had some trust for each other. Right. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And we're fairly cool. Right. Yeah. I'm Cleo, here. Cleo. Calm down, Cleo. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, 
So did you start did did you start playing gigs actually in New York or was it not till no I no I, I I I was only in New York till I was eight years old. Okay, and uh, I didn't start playing gigs until I was like fourteen or fifteen. Uh, and I was I was you know a hot young guitar player. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I say that now because I'm definitely an over the hill guitar player. But, uh, <laughs> You know, I, and, and in the day, you know, I was blindingly fast and, and really? I was pretty good. Yeah. You know? So you I, played I, lead I, at that point. Well, I played guitar. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a, uh, I had a couple of folk bands. One was the Three Prominent Bastards, uh, <laughs> which um, it, it's after an Oscar brand song, That's Three funny. Prominent Bastards. Huh. Uh and, you know, various little groups. I played on uh, uh, KPFK. Down the, in L.A. Yeah, right. the uh, yeah. affiliate uh, with KPFA right. in Berkeley. Uh, and I was on th that show, I think, I was 14 or 15 uh, and played as a solo folk performer. Now, were you going to the Ashgrove at this point? Absolutely. Okay. All the time. I, right. That was my second home. Right. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, I, I have people like Taj Mahal, who's also been a friend of mine for, right. forever. Right. I mean, maybe since I was 14 or 15, which at this point in time is <laughs> 60 years ago. Right? <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah. Now, um, Carol Perry told me he worked at the Ashgrove and that they used to let Taj sleep on the pool tables there. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's not a myth. Mm -hmm. And um, and I remember Taj when he was that age. I mean, right. you know, we were we've known each other that long. Yeah. So he must have moved to LA at around the same time as you. Yeah, yeah. And I also knew the Chambers brothers. Right. When they were a folk group. Right. Uh, and they were gospel before they went electric. Right. Uh, and in fact, I was with a guitar player named Steve Mann. Oh yeah, I know one who he of is. the early yeah. influences of Yorma Kalkinen. Right, and Steve and I were driving to the Chambers Brothers' house for a party. They lived in Silver Lake, California, which is kind of near Hollywood. Right, and um, uh, we got busted. Uh, the cop said he saw Steve make a furtive movement, which is, you know, he looked like he was stashing something right. under the seat. Right. And uh, uh, the cops pulled us over. They arrested Steve. He had to bail out. Uh, but me, they called my parents. <laughs> you know, because you were younger. Because I was, yeah, I was yeah. sixteen. Yeah. How old yeah. was Steve? Uh, he was probably four or five years older than me, okay. so, you know, 20 or 21, maybe. Yeah. Um, and Steve was establishing himself at that time as a Hollywood session guitarist. Really? And he played on the first recording sessions of Sonny and Cher. Along with Larry Taylor. Hey, come on. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Amazing. So this is, this is old Hollywood history. Yeah. And we played the same clubs. I remember, um, uh, oh, come on. What's it, the guy who learned from John Fahey, who, uh, oh, uh, uh, Leo Kotke. Leo Kotke, yeah. I remember Leo Kotke right. when he was a kid. We right. were about the same age. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, I remember Taj and I remember, uh, David King Cohen, who was, uh, a folk guitarist of that genre or age. Huh. Um, you know, we were Hollywood kids. Well, Dave Getz had a great story he told me, which I had never heard this before. He said when Big Brother was had only hired Janice maybe two weeks before, that Paul Rothschild got a hold of her from Electra. Yes. And said, I want to send you to LA to make a record with Taj and Steve Mann. Okay. And she turned it down. Wow. Yeah. I think there are early recordings of Janice and first of all, there are early recordings of Janice and my friend Larry Hanks. Oh, okay. That are circulating around there in the underground. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh Janice and Steve Mann, I think. Interesting. I yeah. mean, old, really old, uh, yeah. not 
not really suitable for release. <laughs> but you know, yeah, Janice was a, a sweetie. Yeah, yeah. Were you guys pretty close? Uh, Janice and my first wife were pals. Really? And they did unspeakable things together. <laughs> uh, well, let's hear some. No, 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 no. No, you can't hear those things. Yeah. Uh, you know, it would defame my ex-wife. And, and, well, my she's gone. Right. Both of my wives are on the other side. I'm sorry. But uh, Janice uh, was a friend. She was always a friend. I have a trove of Janice stories from mm -hmm. when I was young. Right. Uh, I got very sick at some point. And we were all staying at the Chelsea Hotel on 23rd Street in right. New York. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was really sick. I mean, I, they called a doctor who didn't speak English. Uh, which is something that they do at the Chelsea Hotel, at least in those yeah. days. And the guy didn't speak English, but he gave me a shot of something which helped. Uh, uh, but in any event, uh, the band wouldn't have anything to do with me because I was sick. But Janice would come up two or three times a day. Uh, she wiped me down with a washcloth. She was really sweet to me. Wow. And that's you know one of the memories that sticks out in my mind. Yeah. About Janice is her taking care of me. That's wonderful. Sick. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was a good person. Yeah, uh, and she was really smart. She, I got that. She read a lot. I don't know if Dave Getz feeling. told you the real story of Janice, but she was she was smart. No, I, I I picked that up. I read I think a book on her, and I could tell just from her her letters that she was really a sharp yeah sharp person. He said she was a lot of fun too. She was. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Man. Of course yeah. she was fun. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah we talked a lot with, uh, about about Janice, both with, with him and, and with uh, with Peter Alban as well. Yeah, well, but, Peter. But a, lot, I, a lot with. Uh, did with I Dave. tell you that Peter gave me my first job in the Bay Area? No. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Which I generally, maybe one time in three when I play on stage, I'll tell this story. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I went, the, when I first came to the Bay Area, I went to San Francisco State College. That's why I came there. I only lasted 10 weeks. Uh huh. And, um, in any event, Peter was an officer in the San Francisco State College folk music. Club. Right, right. He had told me that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, him and his brother, I guess. Yeah, Rodney. Yeah, right. Rodney, who, um, Rodney was very close to Bill Graham too. They were shared space together. Wow. They, they were in, they had a rehearsal studio. Well, Rodney used it as his workshop and uh, Bill stored all the chairs from the Fillmore there. Wow. And it was on Golden Gate Avenue, one block over from the Fillmore. From the Fillmore? Huh? Yeah. And, um, Bill kept all his chairs there. And, uh, Rodney did his violins there. He made Dave LaFlame's first violin there, uh, electric violin. Wow. Um, and it was a solid body violin. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Rodney was uh, quite brilliant. And in any event, I was going to tell you that Peter Allen gave me my first job in, in the Bay Area. Uh, he hired me to play at the San Francisco State College Folk Music Club's Annual dealy wop. Uh, and, um, he told uh, me he hired Barbara Dane too. I, he did. Yeah. And, and I remember right before I went on, uh, Dan Hicks went on. Aha. Uh -huh. You know, so, you know, I mean, th th you're talking old days here, man. Yeah. Yeah. 1965. 65. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. Cause that's about the time I sounds like he found Janice, right? The end of 65, maybe? Maybe, maybe 66. Yeah. I remember hearing the band without Janice. <clears throat> right, the four piece. Yes. Yeah. And they were good, man. Yeah. They yeah. were really good. Yeah. I mean, they played uh, Hall of the Mountain Kings. Really? Uh, you know, Peter Gint. That's yeah. funny. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, um, so you moved. So you moved here uh, after you'd been in LA for about ten years. 
or were or uh, little about less, eight years? little less. Uh, yeah, I was sixteen when I first when, when I first came up here. It was the summer of sixty four. Oh, okay. And that's when Joe and I met. Okay. Uh, we met because we were both backing up Malvina Reynolds. Right. Right. Uh, you know, who is, she, she, she was, was the ultimate deal. She was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, and she wrote Little Boxes. Right. Little right. Boxes right. on a hill. Yep. Everybody knew and that. And they all, oh, they're all made of ticky tacky. Yes, they right. all made of ticky tacky and they all look the same. Yeah. She was a Berkeley institution. Oh, she was. Absolutely. I remember later on, I played some benefit. I don't think it was with Joe, but I played a benefit for Joe's mother, mm -hmm. who was the author of Berkeley. Right. She, she actually held a, a political office in Berkeley. Right. And I played this gig with her that was kind of a benefit for, oh, I know, my late wife was working there. It was a, uh, my second wife. Uh, yeah. We, it, it was a benefit for a kind of place for mentally disabled people. Okay. And Florence was part of, Florence was Joe's mother. Right. Florence was part of that. Right. Um, yeah. And she was kind of in Berkeley politics for quite a while. From oh, she was. Yeah. Yeah. She was. Yeah. And Warden, his dad, uh, his dad was from Oklahoma. My dad right, was from right, Texas. Right, right. You know? Okay. And, now, did uh, they know each other at all? Well, Those later two? on they knew later each other. Later on they did? Yeah, yeah, when their kids were yeah. playing together. Right, because I know Joe said that his dad was old McDonald or something, and he drove like a truck around L.A. Yeah, and and uh, and in Berkeley, his dad uh, was our gardener for a period. Of time. Right. And I think he had a book. Didn't he have a book that he would sell on the app? He app? did. He did. Yeah. He had a book about, well, it was kind of about Something Joe like not bad for him. an old guy. Or yeah, exactly. had some kind of title exactly. like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I yeah. remember I would see him around. He was a very, very sweet man. That's what I've heard. Gordon. Yeah, I've always heard that. Yeah. Yeah. His mom was a bit of a hell of a Was she? Gordon was good. <laughs> well, his mother was like my mother. Jewish right. women right. who married... <laughs> Uh, you know, guys yeah, from, right. uh, you know, Oklahoma and Texas. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and they were, uh, you know, yeah. they were loud, vociferous, and very left. Right. Uh, I know Joe know. said that he, he always thought his phone was tapped, or they always thought their phone was tapped. My parents met uh, and fell in love as members of the Young Communist League. Right. In the 1930s. Uh, Similar to Barbara Dane, actually. Yeah, I know. Yep. Very similar. Yep. You got it. And her and her husband, I guess, left the party. Really? Yeah. They oh, left Ralph. the party. Yeah. Ah. They left the party kind of early on. They had some kind of disagreement, I guess. Well, of course, my parents ultimately did, too, when they found out that Stalin was Stalin. an anti-Semite. <laughs> right. Not exactly the yeah. guy. The great guy they, they thought. Yeah. Well, my dad used to tell me, Oh, don't worry. There's going to be a Jewish Soviet Socialist Republic. <laughs> you know, Bear of Bishan. There's actually a song about Bear of Bishan that's in the People's Songbook, if you know your left wing history. I've heard about the that. The People's yes, Songbook. I've uh, heard about that. It was a song called uh, And Natasha Drives a Tractor, Grandma Runs the Cream Extractor in Jean Koya, Jean, Jean, Jean. Hey, Jean, hey, Jean, Kia, Koya, hey, Jean, Dewey, hey, Jean, Koya, hey, Jean, Koya, Jean, Jean, Jean. It's a. Uh, Boy, that's, that's deep within yeah, you, Barry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, they were. Uh, yeah, that's they were a trip. Comics, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it, it, now, when you guys started The Fish, I want to say that was 66 when well, you and Joe started doing gigs, is that right? Or was it 65? Uh, 65. 65. And you yeah. guys were just a duo at that point. Exactly. Well, yeah. we cut that little record that had a jug band on one cut. Right. It had me and Joe. I was playing electric guitar. He was playing acoustic on the other cut. And on the other side of that EP was a guy named Peter Krug, 
who was a songwriter from Berkeley. Okay. Was this the one that was cut at Strachwitz's? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In his living room. The first With fix a single and a bike. Yeah. The first fix and a dive. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And um, and the, Joe and I did Superbird as a duo. And oh, then we okay. went on tour as a duo to the Northwest, to the hmm. great Northwest. We played in Portland, Seattle, Eugene, uh, you know, like that. Vancouver, I think. So this is really prior to the band getting together. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So who played with you guys on the record? Was that just the two of you? Actually, on the record itself, um, Joe had kind of a jug band that included uh, Carl Schrager on kazoo and washboard, um, Mike Beardsley, who sang harmony vocals, and Bill Steele, who played bass. Hmm. And that was the jug band. And, and was that upright bass? Me and Joe. Upright bass? No, it was uh, gut bucket bass. Oh, gut bucket. Okay. So a real jug band. A real jug band. Real jug yeah. band. Yeah. 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 What a trip. So. So, uh, so w was it, when did you find Bruce? Well, Bruce, you said, I understood you met in L.A. We met in L.A. Bruce and I went to high school together. Right. And in fact, we met right before high school because we were in a summer school class for the quote gifted, unquote. Uh -huh. Neither of us was gifted. But I'm not going to go there. Uh, yeah. But yes, Bruce and I knew each other from then. And then Bruce and I played together uh, in bands. Mm -hmm. or, you know, folk and that was in L.A.? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So you basically suggested Bruce, Bruce Barthol to come up? He was my roommate. You, oh, you're saying when you moved here? No, yeah. When I was here in Berkeley and first started playing with Joe, Bruce was my roommate in Berkeley. Right. Was this we, the Jabberwock or something? When it you was guys next lived, door to next the Jabberwock. Door to the Jabberwock. Yeah. And uh, Paul Armstrong was our uh, mentor. He, Paul huh. was uh, uh, had been a busker with Phil Marsh. Really? In, in Europe. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Phil goes way back to those times. Yeah, Phil's you bet. told me a lot of stories about uh, about you know the the band that he had. What was the name of his band? I'm blanking now. Oh, I'm um, having a brain fart. Energy Crisis. No, no, no. The no. the other band, the one with uh, uh, with Annie Johnson. Oh. Annie and I were an item back then. Were you really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I always had a crush on Annie. <laughs> if you see this, Annie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, Annie was a very, very sweet person. Yeah, and a really talented uh, Good talented singer. singer. Yeah, yeah. She used to do Hello Central, Give Me Dr. Jazz. Right. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, she was, she was yeah. something. Yeah, she was very cool. So I'm still blanking on uh, how come I can't think of Phil's band. No, they were basically a, a skiffle band. Yeah, cleanliness and godliness. Cleanliness and godliness. <laughs> yes, and they played a lot. They did. They played a lot back yep. in those days yep. in Berkeley. Yeah, and so you guys probably played the Jabberwock, the yep. Cabal. Well, of course, we played yeah. Cabal. Cabal, which I know Carol had something to do with managing, I guess. Uh, yes, and Carol was the manager. Right, he was the manager. Yeah. yeah, but somebody else owned it, I gather. I believe you're right, and yeah. I'm trying to remember because that person was fairly well known too. Yeah, let me let me put this on. And uh, so, so we let's get out of the '60s. Okay, well, <laughs> I, I think the '60s are a really interesting right. time for for me. Right. I, Historic. I, Yes. Historically, it was an amazing time. I mean, uh, and by the way, I played with uh, John Chamberlain in the sixties too. Did you really? Oh, sure. Okay. He was he was the guitar player in Quicksilver. Well, I knew that. Yeah. We got Quicksilver to play the Jabberwock. Did you really? Yeah. Come on, Quicksilver Whoa. played the Jabberwock. Seating capacity maybe sixty or seventy. So were you guys? And kind I think of they filled it up. Were you guys kind of like the house band at the Jabberwock in a way? You could say that. Yeah, because I know Joe had a great story about you guys playing electric instruments in there, and he said it was like just, you know, like a shock. Like, <laughs> I guess, yeah. Yeah. 1965? Right, right. Well, 66. Yeah. By yeah. that time. 65, we were pretty much acoustic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the first Vanguard album, that would have been 67? 
No. 66? Well, I think, I want to say we recorded it in 66, late 66, uh -huh. or early 67. I can't tell you exactly. Yeah. But I do know that by the time the Monterey Pop Festival came along, our album had just been released. Maybe okay. A, maybe a week or two. And that was in the spring of 1967. Okay. So I'm assuming that we recorded late 66, probably. Right? Yeah. And how would you, how would you, uh, what would you say about the, you guys were really one of the main East Bay psychedelic acts. Oh, I think we were. I think you were the only one. Yeah. yeah. And then you had all the San Francisco bands. And I'm just curious about how much interaction, it seems like there's quite a bit of interaction between you guys and, and the San Francisco bands. Well, in those days, it only took like 10 minutes to get over the bridge. Right. <laughs> I mean, you know, and it cost a quarter each way. Right. right. You know, they charge you going and coming. 25 cents. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, sure, we knew all the San Francisco guys. Yeah. I was going to tell you, in Los Angeles, one of the guys that Bruce and I played with, and we knew pretty well, was Mike Wilhelm, who later right. on Charlatans. It, it was a yep. founder member of the Charlatans, and Michael uh, was the leader of the Hootenannies at a club called The Prophet in Woodland Hills. Where Michael's from, that's where his parents were from. Really? So, wow. And then, so of course, when we came to the Bay Area, my old friend Michael uh, was playing in a band called the Charlatans. Wow. I was just reading about them, and uh, they had a really interesting history in terms of that they kind of got, didn't really get the credit kind of that they, they deserved in terms of being really one of the first. No, they were really yeah. the first. They well, really no, were the actually, first. I just saw in Virginia City, Peter Kramer. Peter Kramer played with mm -hmm. the Sopwith Camel. Okay. And they, made, they were certainly the first band with a hit. At the Red Dog? Uh, no, well, they were there. Right. Peter is from Virginia City. He was born in Virginia Too City. Too much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So did he have something to do with getting the charlatans in there? I'm sure he did. Yeah. You know, I'm sure he did. What a trip. Yep. Yeah, the world's so, closer than you might think. Well, no, I mean, I, I really got this feeling that, that, that between, you know, you guys and Big Brother and and uh, I don't know how close you guys were to the dead, but, oh, well, you, know, you know, that everybody was kind of like very intermingled. At well, you know, Peter Robin's brother, Rodney, had a place at 1090 Page. Right, right. The rehearsal. Right. Yeah. And that was a Grateful Dead hangout. Right. Uh, and Rodney knew everybody. Everybody knew Rodney. He ultimately opened up a music store on Haight Street. Um, and in fact, oh, well, I guess it's not here. I was just, I have a mandolin that belonged to Bob Hunter. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Uh, it, well, it's a crappy mandolin. I mean, it's like, you know. It's an electric and acoustic mandolin. But yeah, I was going to pull it out. But I really Now, don't. George Hunter and Robert Hunter are not related at all. They're not. Yeah, okay. And George Hunter, of course, became an artist, really, more than anything else. They did album covers. Interesting. The, uh, Happy Trail. They did that? George did that. Happy oh, Trail. wow. And is that the, the new writers? Shoulder. Oh, Quicksilver. Okay. Right. What a trip, man. Hey, come on. Yeah. Small family. So you were a little younger than some of the other kids. Definitely younger. Yeah. 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 No, I was... Uh, Bob Weir and I were the babies. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. He's younger than I am. Yeah. Is he really? Yeah, maybe yeah. three or four months. Huh. And Bruce Barthol yeah. was younger than me. Was he really? Yeah, he was born in November. I was born in June okay. of 1947. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and we're in there somewhere, too. Yeah. 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 Well, one thing I gotta say is to me, you got, your guy's first album was one of the most psychedelic albums of that time period. Well, and I often tell people 
that's not an album that was made by professionals. It's a, it's a indigenous music from the Bay Area <laughs> in the mid 60s. Right. Uh, and we were anything but professional. I mean, we were definitely in some other universe. Some other universe, but you guys totally had a vibe. Oh, we definitely. I had mean, a vibe. like Section Forty Three to me is like one of the all-time greatest psychedelia pieces, and it's the background to the Monterey Pop movie. Yes, is it really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Which was done by uh, Hang on, D. A. Pennymaker. Exactly. Right. Penny Baker. Penny Baker. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow, I remember seeing you guys in that film, actually. Yeah, Yeah. because Joe's wearing a helmet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's right. And I was wearing the same army shirt that he wore in the Woodstock movie. Right, and he told me that he he was high as a kite when he was... (laughs) He was definitely out there. Yeah, Yeah. that's what he said. Yeah, no, we we were not bullshit. We were actually... Just as crazy as it, we appeared to be. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, how did uh, how did uh, uh, Dave Bennett Cohen come into it? He's from New York as well. David and I, um, so Joe and I were playing together, and uh-huh. I actually put together the band. The band included Bruce Barthol, who I went to high school with. Right. David and I were in a band together called. I, I don't know if it was called the Second Coming or it became the Second Coming after we left. But um, in that band was the guy who later played bass with Steve Miller. Um, oh yeah, Lonnie Turner. Exactly. Yeah. Lonnie I know, Turner I know, was I in our yeah. band. We were in a band with Lonnie. It's interesting. Uh, yeah. And David and I were playing together. And so when we were putting together the electric band, I said, "Well, I know a guy who plays." keyboard i was lying actually because the only thing i ever heard him play was uh st louis blues da, 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 right um david played that on the keyboard he wasn't really a keyboard player he was a guitar player and he was a really good guitar he was a, he would he yeah. gave lessons to jerry garcia did he really yep. i never knew that yep but he was a really good guitar player i thought the two of you guys were a great Kind of contrast. Yeah, no, David. Uh, style. David gave guitar lessons to Jerry Garcia. That is wild. Yeah, that's really wild. Yeah. And how about Chicken Hirsch? How did he come? Uh, well, we had a drummer before Chicken, whose name was John Francis Gunn. Okay. And John Francis, when we started doing our Vanguard sessions, uh, John was always a drinking man. <laughs> I say that because that's what, uh, when Lee Marvin was divorcing Michelle Triola Marvin, they weren't divorcing because they weren't married. Right. uh, But when they were getting separated, uh, she was accusing Lee Marvin of being an alcoholic. And he brought in a whole bunch of Hollywood actors to say he wasn't an alcoholic, he was a drinking man. (laughs) (laughs) that was a famous trial oh come on yeah that was a super famous trial well it established a precedent in California law right that you don't have to be married to be entitled to uh, palimony or alimony or whatever right yeah yeah so well I have so many questions to ask you I can tell it's going to be a long interview Uh, uh so um we're really back in the weeds, though. I know we are. That's yeah, the I mean, thing. We we're made past I know we haven't made it past Jeez. 1967, but I have to say, for me, this is a fascinating period. And, and, and between 66 and 1970, to me, is just such all the stuff that went on. I mean, the hate thing was such a short period of time in reality. And at a certain point in time, both Joe and I lived in San Francisco. He oh, lived, did you? Yep. Uh, I did not know. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Oh, he um, okay. he lived on. I'm trying to remember the name of the street. Uh, but he lived there. He lived there with. I can't remember who, the woman he was with then. Yeah. When not I first met, <laughs> no, when I first met Joe, he was with his first wife. Oh, right, right, right. Whose okay. name was Kathy. How long did you guys live there? 
Uh, I actually met my first wife. I was living at the 11th Avenue Circus, which was at 11th and between Kirkham and Judah okay. on 11th Avenue in the Sunset District. Okay. We had these young guys who were musicians who lived at the place too, and they became the Flaming Groovies. Oh, wow. What a trip. Cyril lived in the attic. Cyril Jordan lived okay. up in the attic. And then Danny Mim and, you know, other members of Flaming Groovies were always, always around the house. Wow. And of course, I lived there. And um, it was also sort of a Bill Graham presents kind of group of people. My, my late wife, my first wife, worked for Bill. She was okay. the uh, hat check lady and uh -huh. the coat checker lady at the Fillmore. And, uh, and there was a couple that lived there, Al and Honey Kramer. Honey has become Honey Green. She's on Facebook now. She's actually in hospice. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, Al was Bill's business partner. Interesting. Al, Al Kramer. Yeah. Uh, and they did. They were partners. Uh, and how Ali's, long? How long did that last with the oh, tour? Probably six months or a year. No, I mean, I'm, not much longer than Chet Elms. <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Were you pretty close to Chet? Oh, I was definitely close to Chet. He was my pal. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Chet Helms we're talking about. We are talking about Chet. Yes. Helms. And uh, I know that you guys, <laughs> I love the story about you guys playing the uh, Matrix. <laughs> oh, did Joe tell you that one? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, the one so about, the, one about the recording. Yeah. About the recording. <laughs> And you guys having to be backstage because you were too young. <laughs> That's right. This is we such weren't a great old enough story. to play yeah. the Matrix, so yeah. we we recorded. They uh, recorded in Berkeley. Yeah, really? we recorded <laughs> the bass and drums together, and then we the band tried to play over it, and it didn't work. And you so, and you weren't there, weren't you backstage or something? Well, I was backstage. I heard it. Right, it you heard a, it, but apparently it was a disaster. Asked it, yeah, it was asked asked it prior. <laughs> it was definitely a disaster. I love it. There were no count offs on the dance. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have everything. No. Oh man! And then I guess he said the next night you guys had to play behind chicken wire or something. We did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they could be in the be on stage. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's a great story. But uh, I mean, you guys played. I mean, it's amazing to me the the. the the bills that both Chet Helms and Bill Graham did back in those days. I mean, you guys had Led Zeppelin opening. For you. We did. Yeah. yeah. No, uh, it, well, I hate to list all our opening acts. Jimmy Buffett just passed away. Right. But he opened for us later. He opened for us like in 1972. Right. Uh, when we were playing the Lion Chair in San Anselmo. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Buffett, we paid him 50 bucks to be our opening act. Right. I, I saw him at the Troubadour. Actually. I should have been nicer to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? I have a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, although, you know, I mean, um, Robert Plant and I have always been friends. Have you? And he, uh, apparently the last time, not the last time we played San Francisco, but the time before that, he said something about me. Oh, well, that's on, nice. On the stage. Yeah, that's no, nice. We were, uh, we, yeah. we, uh, destroyed a hotel room together in, in <laughs> Amsterdam. Uh, I mean, you know, literally we yeah, just dismantled it, yeah. the chair, we <laughs> put it in the fireplace and tried to make ourselves warm. But, um, That's great. but uh, yeah, Robert and I were friends. We're still friends, I That's guess. Nice. I haven't seen yeah. him in ages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, we had lots of bands, though, that opened. Pink Floyd opened for us. Wow. Uh, Crazy. You know, I mean, lots of folks. But that was true of Quicksilver as well. I mean, you know. Right. We were so or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Big Brother. Yeah. I know uh, Dave gets read me this big, long line of people that opened for them. Same kind of deal. I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Now, Dave Getz told me that him and Peter were in the band right before you and Joe played at Woodstock. That's right. 
And he said they quit right before Woodstock, not knowing that that's where you guys were going to be. Hey. Yeah. What can I say? <laughs> that was our rhythm section. Yeah. So we, who ended up doing Woodstock with you? Uh, we had a bunch of guys whose names are pretty much lost to history, but a guy named hmm. uh, Mark Kapner played keyboards. Um, Doug Metzler played bass. And... Greg Dewey played drums. Greg actually was with Mad River before he played with us oh, and, okay. and was one of the guys who was the mainstay of Mad River. I don't know if you remember them. I'm not, I've heard the name, but don't know. Uh, the guitarist and singer from Mad River, who was Lawrence Hammond, became a doctor, mm. a, a medical doctor. Wow. And, uh, you know, had, had quite an impressive career. That was a good band, Mad River. Now, so were these guys that were on the East Coast when you found them, or no, were, were you bringing in people from the West Coast? From Berkeley. Okay, interesting. I mean, you know. Yeah, it's funny how many musicians, you know, from the Bay Area you hear about, and you really don't know very much about them. You know, they kind of did it for maybe a short period of time. Well, Doug, who was our bass player, eventually went back to UC Davis, got a doctorate, Mm -hmm. and became a professor at UC Davis uh, of psychology. Right. There were a lot of smart people back in the 60s in bands, weren't there? Hey. There really were. I mean, you know, like uh, uh, Commander Cody. Oh. You know, the who's the guy, the, the, the guitar player? And he's like, now he's like... Bill a, Kirchin. No, not Kirchin. I'm talking about the other guy, the guy that sang. Oh, Billy... No, not Billy C. There's a there's another guy in there who is like John Tetch or what is the guy's name? Oh, Tetchy. Come on, isn't that his name? No. Tetchy or something? No, I know who you're talking. You know about, who I'm though. talking about? That guy's like a serious. No, I know. Yeah, like George uh, Frayne. Yeah, he was a great was artist. The commander. Yeah. Yeah. No, and his brother was a really good artist. Really. Um, yeah. Huh. And um, they were all from, I mean, they were really from the University of Wisconsin at I think Madison. It was Michigan. Madison. Michigan. No, they were from Ann Arbor, though. Oh, guys. that's right. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. They're yeah. from Michigan. Yeah. You're right. But I thought his name was John Tishy or something like that. Yeah. And he, this guy's like brilliant. I mean, he's no, like. No, we could look it up. I on could. Google, yeah. But that, no, it's yeah, all right. We'll, we'll do right. it later. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, it, it just kind of always blows my mind how, you know, how many people out of that. I mean, you know, somebody like Dave Getz, I had no idea he was the artist he is. Oh, Dave has yeah. a master's degree. Yeah, he's got a master's degree. Yeah. 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 Taught art at, at, uh, at the Art, uh, art Institute. Art Institute. He right. went to the Art Exactly. Institute. Yeah. yeah. No, so. and a really good artist, too. Yeah. So did you know guys like Mouse and, and Mouse well, Kelly and all those guys? Yeah. Stanley was a witness at my first marriage uh, to my first wife. Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. So I, you know, which he says he doesn't remember, but I do. Because huh. he's on the marriage certificate. Right. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's wild. So uh, tell me about Woodstock. What was that like? Uh, Did you guys helicopter in? Was that the deal? Well, ultimately, uh, when we first went in, we drove. Right. Which took like two and a half hours to go seven and a half miles. Or right, so. right. I mean, it was really unbelievably yeah. difficult. Yeah. Um, and I remember seeing the acts that night, John Baez. All right. Go through the, I mean, the, the evening acts. The next day, I flew over in a helicopter because I found out I could get a helicopter. Ah, okay. And and I waited actually until maybe an hour or two before we were supposed to go on. And I went with this very shy little English guy who was huddled in the corner of the helicopter. And I said, "Who's that?" And I said, "Oh, he's from England. His name is Joe Cocker." Yeah, and, and I kind of said hello, and uh, yeah. he was very nice. We yeah. worked together later in his career, at, right? Somewhere in San Jose, and, uh, 
at a shopping center. Huh. Anyway, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I remember him. Uh, and, uh, and, and I saw him perform, and it was fucking great. I yeah. mean, he was great. Great singer. Spaz movements. Yeah, but an incredible that. singer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Who 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 do you remember specifically from uh, that stood out in Woodstock? Because I know Joe said he was there all four days or something. Yeah, I was there yeah. well. Were you there at the same time? Of course. Yeah. So uh, were you did you catch actually I uh, will say I actually came back earlier. Uh-huh. I hitched a ride with the Grateful Dead. Oh, did you? And we went back to the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, I had played earlier that, uh, I mean, they were, we had jam sessions in the hallway of the Holiday Inn where we were all staying. Huh. And I remember playing with uh, Jerry Garcia and David Bromberg. Oh, uh, wow. The two of them and me. Yeah. Uh, playing together. And it, yeah. it was pretty good. Yeah. So, so the, the other thing I was going to say is you had this really wicked vibrato. I mean, you're, yeah, yeah. I know yeah. you still do, but yeah. I'm just saying that was like you and Cipollina both had this kind of. But he did a different thing with it. Was he, his more from the whammy bar? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And I I pretty much I only use it for single notes. The whammy bar? Yeah. Yeah, but and you John, used it as well. And John used it for chords. Ah, okay. I mean, he did. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, Natalie knows. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Natalie, I mean, if you yeah. want to know anything about John, John's yeah. not here anymore, but Natalie will tell you. Yeah. I know a little, but it was before my time, technically. Was it? 18 years, my senior. Okay, yeah. She's not that young, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're not was, supposed to say that. Oh, I think you should see what he says to me on stage sometimes. <laughs> I do not pick on you. Uh, I was going to say, your style, I mean, it's obviously folk was a huge part of, of what you do. And and would you say, like, blues was a, a part of that, too? Yes, but I also would say that I had two big influences. One was Hamza Aldean. Um, I'm not sure who that is. Hamza uh, was the guy who took the Grateful Dead to Egypt. Oh, okay. And he was an oud player, and he was a vanguard recording artist, which oh, is why we, one of the reasons why we later became friends. But I knew who he was, and um, the other one was Kimi Oito, who was a uh, Japanese classical musician, okay. played the uh, kodo. Hmm. Um, so my two foreign influences, and Ravi Shankar, and uh, um, you know Khan Ali Akbar Khan. So were were those influences to you before pretty much most of the other folks in the in the in the rock world? Yes. Sounds like it. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, you know that Near Eastern sound that we had that is part of Section Forty Three, right? And, and right. that. Yeah. Um, and Section 43, we recorded, um, I didn't realize it, but Bloomfield sort of picked up on that. I was going to say. it's part of the East Meets Very, West. very much yeah. a part of that. And yeah. I always wondered about whether you guys did yours before he yes. picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, Nick claims, Nick Gravenitis claims that he has something to do with that song as well. Probably did. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. Nick, Nick, and uh, Nick and Michael were very close. Yeah. I remember going in; <laughs> they called me in to do a track for Hot Nazis, which was a, <laughs> which was a uh, Mitchell Brothers film, and they were doing a soundtrack. <laughs> and That's and great. they called me in to, to be the whistler on the track, <laughs> you know, because they knew I could whistle, but you know, I, I you know, I couldn't deliver that day. <laughs> but uh, but I remember the two of them couldn't get the it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, scoot over just a little bit so you're oh, in the sure. frame here. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here I am. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so how close were you and Bloomfield? Were you guys friends? Oh, absolutely. No, he yeah. was the producer. That's of right. My he Columbia produced one of your records. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay. And uh, and and Nick, you obviously met very early on too. Uh, Nick. 
I remember inviting, I had a band that was rehearsing at my house called the Crabs. And, uh, okay, it's a funny name. Uh, but the Crabs, I called over Nick because I knew Nick did a little production. Right. And I called over Nick to my house in Berkeley in the, in the, it was actually in Oakland, in the Oakland Hills. I called him over, that would have been 1969. Mm -hmm. I called him over to hear the crabs and yep. to ask if he would consider producing them. And he said no. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But I've known Nick a long time. Uh, yeah. I yeah. knew him through Janice and I knew him through Michael. And probably through Quicksilver as yeah, well. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And how about the airplane? Were they kind of in your orbit at all? Or sure. Or, okay. As a matter of fact, uh, when we first began playing together in the band, um, there was a guy who came and said he wanted to manage us. His name was Matthew Cates. Hmm. And Matthew Cates was the manager of the Jefferson Airplane. And he also managed... Uh, it's a beautiful day, mm -hmm. and that may be the short list. Hmm. But in any event, Matthew came over. He wanted to manage us, and I remember Joe and I went over to see Marty mm -hmm. and ask him about this guy Matthew Cates, and they said no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to have friends that can warn Matthew you. Matthew <laughs> may still be alive, so yeah. I want to be careful yeah. about. Yeah. So said. Bill Belmont ended up being your guys' manager? No. Who was it? Ed Denson. Ed Denson was the manager. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then where did Bill Belmont come into it? Uh, later. He was later? Uh, he was our roadie. He was the roadie? Okay. Yeah, he was our roadie in the, right. in the late 60s, maybe the very tail end of the 60s, Okay. early 70s. Yeah. yeah. And then when did, the, when did the fish pretty much stop being an entity? 1971. 71. Okay. But Joe and I would do gigs from time to time together for the following 10 or 15 years. Right. Right. But, uh, and then, and then, now you went to law school. I didn't go to law school. You didn't go to law school? No. Okay. Now, how did you end up being a lawyer? Self study. Self study. Was that starting went, in the, I was that the to, early 70s? I went to a Sal Extension University which people who are crueler than I am call it matchbook you. Because <laughs> that's how they advertise? Well, they used to advertise a matchbook. That's right? great. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> so now, what, what was that the early 70s? Uh, what happened was my oldest son was born in 1977. Okay. And... And I had begun the study of law earlier when I was 23, which was like right after Joe and I broke up, the band broke up the first mm -hmm. time. Right. I got myself registered as a law student and uh, started studying. But, you know, I was busy. I signed a contract with Columbia in the right. interim. I did a record with Plumfield. Right. I wasn't into really ready to be a lawyer yet. Yeah. But after my oldest son was born, which was 77, and I was turning 30, um, I decided, well, you know, I really don't want to go on the road and have a kid because I had done that before and my marriage failed. Right. So, um, what? I can relate. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. No, we were, uh, I was a kid. Yeah. Uh, you know, in retrospect, my first wife and I had very little in common other than sex. Mm -hmm. We definitely had that in common. But <laughs> I don't know if we had much else in common. Right. Yeah. So. And are you still in touch with that with that kid? No. The uh, the kid uh had a major disability. She was um uh, I, I'm she had cerebral palsy. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah. And she passed Wait, away in her late 40s. Oh, I'm sorry. No, oh, okay. Yeah. What are you going to do? So, so essentially, you, you figured being a lawyer was a good 
way of being able to raise your son. Sort of. I mean, I, I wanted to do something that would keep me at home, but would right. also give me the opportunity to play music. To play music, yeah. So, yeah. So, so that was a good blend. Now, were you were you still going on the road after you became a lawyer? Or? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But not often. Yeah. Maybe once yeah. or twice a year. Yeah. With the fish, you guys were probably out the whole time, I would think. Uh, we played, in 1968, we played 300 dates in 365 oh days. Oh, God. And some of those were double days, where we played in the afternoon and had another wow. gig at night. Yeah. And in fact, when we played the uh, Magic Mountain Music Festival in uh, uh, on Mount Tam, in Mill Valley, I, in nominally, um, we were playing in Seattle that weekend. We played in Seattle the evening before. We flew down in the afternoon. The Hell's Angels took us up the mountain on their motorcycles. Uh, and we played a set. We drove back down and we played the evening in Seattle again. Oh, my God. Because we were booked there for the weekend. Jeez. So we did a lot of crazy stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds yeah. like it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and then yeah. you guys were the ones responsible for the banana craze, I we understand. We were. Yeah. Yes. It was my big mouth, actually. But it's okay. <laughs> you did the Chronicle? <laughs> you know, I was, I was the guy who did it from the stage. And then uh, uh, I remember... We were in like some town in Massachusetts, not Boston. We played Boston the next night at mm -hmm. the Boston Garden. Yeah. But which was a big, you know, kind of arena show. But uh, the night before, I think we were in, uh, I can't remember, a town in Massachusetts. Hmm. And I had related to the audience because we had just heard that Jim Morrison urinated on a cop in Florida. And I told the audience that story. I said, you know, we just heard from Jim Morrison and he pissed on a cop down in Florida. And the audience cheered, right? And you could see the cops kind of like yeah. move back on the wall. <laughs> the next night, when we were at the Boston Garden, there was probably 200 cops there, uh, you know. Did, ready, they, did, they ready arrest, for us. did they arrest Joe or something on that? Not, not there. But they they arrested him from the night before in Massachusetts. Oh, they did. And, but okay. he, he really got arrested for what I said. Really? Yeah. Because they assumed Country Joe must be respons responsible for whatever the band said, so they arrested him. Unbelievable. Which I believe was a big relief to me. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. so. But he told me he got off. He did. What yeah. did you say? Well, he wasn't the guy. It was me. <laughs> so what okay. did you say, though? Sorry, I, I told him the story about Jim Morrison pissing on the oh, cop. Oh, that was it. Oh, they, they didn't like it. that. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah incredible. Huh. I remember there was a captain a in the Boston, it was Boston police captain. His name was Captain Donovan. And he said, I better That's not it. hear one word out of you fellas. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I heard this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was telling me that. Uh, now, um, you guys were under contract. What, what is the name of the guy that uh, signed you to Vanguard? Sam Charters. Sam Charters, right. So Sam Charters is the one that, now you guys had, was it a four-record contract with Vanguard? No, I think it was 10. 10. But it, it was absurd. It was a horrible contract. Right, right. Um, Sam, by the way, Sam produced some of the finest blues. Oh, absolutely. Sides. I mean, absolutely. if you know that series, oh, yeah. Chicago, Chicago Blues, blues today. today. You bet. Right. Of course. And it included Otis Rush, mm -hmm. um, uh, Buddy Guy. Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, right. James Cotton, exactly. Otis Spann. You got it. J.B. Hutto. And, and later on, Sam recorded me with Otis Spann. I know, and I wanted to talk to you about that. Okay. Well, so, so... Two things. One is you did a Vanguard record, as I recall, that had Donny Hathaway, or was that on yes. Columbia? No, it was on Vanguard. That was on Vanguard, yep. and it had uh, Donny Hathaway playing piano behind you. He did. 
And then who else was on the album? Was it Philip uh, Church? Philip Church played bass. Right. Who it became an iconic jazz guitar player. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and Morris Jennings on drums. Okay. And Gerald Sims on guitar. Right. If you know the Chicago guys. Yeah. I mean, it was it was basically the chess house band. Yeah. So Donny Hathaway was the chess piano player. He was. I did not know that. Yes, sir. That's amazing. Hey. Too much. And I remember him. I mean, even though, you know, we only met for a few days in the studio. Yeah. He was just a really radiant personality. Yeah. Interesting. So now that was after the Otis Man record? Was that like 1970 that you did No, that? it was before. Oh, was it before the Otis Oh, yeah. Okay, so was that 68 or something? No, it was like 68. I spent New Year's Eve 1969, 1970 in Chicago. Oh. I flew in. And you did both records? And there had been a... No. Oh, okay. I did the Otis... Span record maybe later in 71 or 72. Okay. I'm guessing. All right. Yeah. I'm guessing. I yeah. don't know precisely. He would have died right after that, I want yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me about that. What was that like, recording with Span? Oh, well, you know, he's a genius. He was an absolute genius. Yeah. yeah. So. And were you the only one from California on that record? Absolutely. No, they put me on there in hopes that it would sell records. Right. Right. Because I was a rock star. Right. Yeah, right. they have a rock star. Right. right. <laughs> There's a few blues albums where they did that. They had Mick Taylor on some uh, Sunnyland Slim records. And, Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So tell me about Sam Charters. What was he like? Oh, Sam. Sam, if you know your blues. And I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sam produced a lot of that early rural country blues right. stuff. Right. You know, Sam is the guy really who did uh, Blind Blake, uh, Blind Blake in the Bahamas. Really? Yeah. I did not know that. Yep. Uh, and he did. Um, skip James, maybe? He did Skip James. Right. He certainly did. Right. And, and a lot of those early guys. Book, right. Book, Book, Book of White. Book of White, right. Um, you know. Now, how many of those guys did you get to be on shows with? Uh, I knew Booker from L.A. Did from you really? From the Ash Grove? Yeah. Wow. I met him down there. And, and in fact, Booker, uh, uh, I remember taking him to a restaurant. And I was buying lunch or whatever it was. Uh -huh. And I said, Booker, you can have anything on that menu you like. And he's looking at the menu like this. And somewhere in the middle of it, I realized... Oh, man. He wasn't, wow. He wasn't going to tell me that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I said, I said, it looks like you forgot your glasses, Booker. I said, let me read the menu to you. And he said, oh, yeah, I'd appreciate that. That's good. That's good. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and uh, so I read the menu to him and he picked out his food. But yeah, I knew Booker. I knew Mance Lipscomb. Wow. Um, I mean, I considered him a friend. Yeah. Now, were these all from Berkeley? That well, I mean, obviously, LA. Booker was L.A. LA. Really? So yeah. you know, knew Man Slips came from L.A.? Yeah, and my wow. friend Ed Denson was his road manager at that. Wow. Which I didn't realize. I met Ed briefly in L.A. in 1963. What a trip, man. Yeah. Yeah. Small, you know, the folk scene or the blues scene or whatever it was, yeah. was very small. Yeah. And played in clubs that seated maybe 50, 60, 70 people. Right. It was not, I mean. Not what it became later on. Right. Yeah. And these yeah. people are giants to me now, but mm -hmm. not then. Right. You know? Yeah. And. Uh, we haven't made it out of the 60s. I yet. know we. <laughs> I know we haven't. <laughs> but you have, to, you have to admit it's a pretty exciting time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, what 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 blues acts do you remember from when you're with the Fish? As far oh, as the, the, that you guys played with Muddy Waters. Okay. I mean, geez, man, come on. James Cotton. Of oh, James used to come sit in with us. Did he? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Big smile with that gold tooth. Right with the gold yeah. tooth. Oh yeah. man. Yeah. yeah. He was a wonderful guy. Yeah, he was a wonderful yeah. guy. Luther Tucker. Oh man. Yeah. So, uh, uh, 
two of the guys you've been playing with for an awful long time are obviously Peter Peter Alban. Peter Alban and I have been playing together, as I told you, in like my 40, first job. Like 40 years. 40. 60? Yeah. 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. But in a band for 40. Is that yeah. right? Well, no, because uh, he he and David were part of Country Jones. Right. Fish. They were in the fish at the right before so, Woodstock. Yeah. Right. Which was more than 50 years ago. True. Closer to 55 years ago. True. Yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, uh, let's talk about the dinosaurs. When did that When did that get started? Now, see, now you're in Natalie's area of experts. Okay. <laughs> what year was that? Uh, 1982. 82. And how did that all come about? Um, I was playing a gig on the Russian River with Spencer. Okay, Spencer Dryden. Right. Was the original airplane and drummer? Peter, and Peter Alvin. And, and Peter, we were, okay. we were a trio. Okay. And somebody said something to us, and I said, oh, we're just a bunch of old dinosaurs. Ah. And, and, um, and we realized we needed another person or two to be in the band. Right. So the first person we called because we knew it, he'd be easy. Because <laughs> he joined everybody's band <laughs> was was John was John Chevalina yeah. yeah yeah and um, and then we played our first gig at the old Waldorf when it was in that kind of modern complex in the, oh yeah yeah in the Embarcadero area exactly yeah, right and and uh, who jumps up on stage while we're playing Robert Hunter aha uh -huh. and Hunter and I had been in a couple of bands together. Oh, had you? Yeah. Okay. Before that. Right. Um, Bob and I were drinking partners in the uh, early, to, uh, during the 70s. Okay. We were drinking pals. And we'd get stone cold drunk together and we'd kind of thrash around. And then <laughs> I, I, I actually, uh, uh, when I would go to England, I would stay at Bob's place because he was living in the west of London. Ah. Uh, with his first wife. Uh, and ultimately, while he was with his first wife, he met his second wife, who he's still with today, Maureen. Uh huh. Uh, so. Who she's still with us, but he's not. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so, so had he made a lot of money with the dead in terms no. of songwriting? No. No. Okay. No, in the early 70s? I don't know when he started making money with the dog. Oh, probably 80s. In the 80s. 80s, okay. Yeah, I mean, when yeah. they became sort of institutional and right. big time. Right. Or bigger time. Not yeah. big time like now. Right. But right. big time for them. They were playing stadiums and. No, you know, not. In, in the 80s. By the, the 80s, 80s, they were. Yeah. 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 Did you ever meet Bob Dylan? No. No. Okay. I've never met him. Okay. I mean, you know, or maybe maybe I saw him at rehearsal one day. But did you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I met him. Did you ever play Newport? Did you, you met him. I met him. Yeah. Did With you? Bob Hunter. Oh, through Bob Hunter. At, uh, okay. Dad in uh, Dad and Dylan shows. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Right. Now, did did you ever live in Oregon? No. Okay. No, but we were up there for the shows. Wait a second. I went up there briefly a couple of years ago. Trying to relocate in the Bay Area was wasn't very easy at that right. point. So I did. I circled the Northwest for a little bit. And you know who just there. moved up there is Greg Douglas. Yeah, I yeah. just played a game yeah. with Greg yeah, Douglas yeah, 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 the yeah. weekend before this last. Oh, did you really? Yeah, we yeah, were in yeah, Arcadia yeah, yeah. together. Okay, interesting. Yeah. yeah, he's a good guy. Oh, actually, yeah. did live in Oregon when I was a teenager. He moved to Coos Bay. I yeah. know. Yeah. 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 Just moved there. I know. This just year. Played last yeah. weekend, right? Was it last yeah. weekend? Yeah, the weekend before this Two last one. Right. Yeah. Yep. Right. Now, did he, he have some? Did he have something to do with Country Joe at one point? I got the feeling maybe he had played with Joe. Greg. Uh, he played with everybody. It's Greg like. was in a band called the Country Weather Band. Oh. That okay. were from Berkeley. Okay. And his first guitar idol 
Yeah. You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he tells me that every time we see him. Does he? Yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. Uh, which I'm nobody's guitar idol anymore. I mean, I can barely <laughs> play the goddamn thing. But, you know, in those days, I was... I in those was, days, you were, at the, you were at the head of the class, yeah. no doubt about it. Yeah. yeah, you certainly were. I'd say it was you, Cipollina, uh, obviously Bloomfield, Elvin, guys like that, and... Garcia. And Garcia, yeah. And Yorma. And Yorma, yeah, yeah sure. that's true. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. Did you know Yorma pretty well? Not really well. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both friends of Steve Mann. Right. And when I first came north, Steve gave me Jerry Kalkinen's number. Hmm. Uh, he wasn't Yorma back then. Oh, really? Jerry, Jerry. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Wow. Now, he played some gigs with Janice, apparently. He did. Yeah. Because yeah. I saw a photo the other day. of. Yeah. No, and uh, yeah. so did my friend Larry Hanks, who's right. still alive, and he's in his 80s, and he's playing. Right. Larry is a wonderful folk performer. I don't know if you've ever heard. I've of heard the name, but I don't oh, don't, don't uh, know who he is. Master musician. Huh. Wow. And he's Charlie. Oh, Charlie Cocky, who is in the uh, Chocolate Watch Band. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. Chocolate Watch Band. Was that an early San Francisco band? It was. Yeah, I've heard that name. We visited my friend Charlie in Brno. He's 80. Outside of Brno. He lives in a little town called Bigodice. Now, where's that? In Italy? No, in the Czech Republic. Oh, really? Yeah. He's married wow. to a Czech woman. And he, he's, he wrote one of the songs that I do. A wonderful song. And he's... he's uh, so Natalie and I got to his house... Yeah. And he sits down at the piano and plays like a 30 or 40 minute yeah. uh, Franz Liszt or Schubert, Schubert. Wow. piece on the piano. It was amazing. Made and he had just, oh my God. he's only picked up the piano yeah, in the last 20 too. years. Yeah, he was a guitar player. Yeah. You know, and a good guitar player. Yeah. I mean, he still plays okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, they were funny. They were so funny telling stories all night long, going back to 1964 or something together. Yep. Trading songs back and forth. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. And each yeah. one filling in blank spots of their memories. Yeah, that's a great yeah. thing to do. That's a it great is. thing to do. <laughs> I agree. I do that sometimes, and it's yeah, it's because because you always get these you always get these places where you just completely blank on somebody. Somebody goes, "Remember this happened?" And you're like, "Really?" <laughs> So Charlie's one of the people we saw when we were on the road, and so's Ben Perkoff. Right. We visited him in Berlin, where mm -hmm. he's been living for the last 26 years. Yeah. Incredible. Now, he's got a brother that plays, right? A brother, a cousin, Cousin, uncle. brother, father. Yeah. Father uncle. Beat poet. One of them is a pianist, right? Cy Perkoff. Cy right. Now, who is that? Is that his brother? No, it's oh. his uncle. That's his uncle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And David, cousin David. Cousin David, yeah, he comes and horn plays player. horn with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ben is a wonderful player. Amazing player. Yeah, Amazing. I've only heard him once or twice. Oh, I can't fantastic. remember. It was a long, long time ago. And you play the saloon. You've been playing the saloon. I want to say almost as long as me. Uh, I've been, you know, eighties. I right? had a falling out with Myron. So did I. Maybe nine or ten <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So um, did I. He, you know, first of all, we were at, we were making, we were charging $7 at the door. Right. And we were doing $16, $17, $1,800 a night. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Drink. And Myron said, I really need to put my own guy in the door because, you know, I'm not exactly sure who's getting through and who's not. Mm. So I said, well, that's okay, Myron. I mean... He only charges hundred dollars to put his guy on the door. Mm -hmm. So, and he put Lonnie's Showtime on the door. If you know, Lonnie. I don't know who that is. I know Greg. Or Greg, you yeah, know yeah. One of those or two. one yeah. of the well, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I said that's okay, Myron. I'll do that. And then you know, so like three or four gigs go by, and he tells me, I I'm not going to let you keep the door money anymore. I'll give you a thousand dollars, and I keep the rest. And I said, well, that's it, Myron. 
<laughs> yeah. Nine years later. One more gig. I think I think a few people had that happen. Yeah. yeah. Nine years later. Yeah. Yep. Did he call you back? Nine years nine later. Years That's later. what he did with me too. Yeah. It took me longer well, than nine then, years. Right. I want to say I stopped working for him in the early nineties, and then I didn't start working for him until about four years ago. Wow. Well, Again, he called me up out of the blue. Sort of yeah. Yeah. Middle yeah. that one. Yeah. Because ben was the arbiter. Was plumbing for him. I do love that place it. though. Yeah, I really no, there's do. a part of me there's, that likes it. Oh, there's a yeah. there's a great vibe there. It's and a great know, sounding room. You always get That's to, one you thing know, people from all over the world. Yeah. Over there yeah. Too. So tell me about some of your most recent travels. It sounds like you've been uh, you've been going over to Europe together and tell them where we went. Yeah. Well, we started in, in August of 23, 22. 22. 22, and we did a Soul Festival in the UK, in Kent. And, yeah, we did a tour of the UK, and we a little tour. And we did other, other uh, cities, uh, which were, we did uh, London. We did London, we, we did, did uh, Swindon. Swindon. Yes. We did the Isle of Wight. Mm -hmm. That was amazing, I loved that place. This little museum. And we're going back. I know we're going, we're going back. back. This next log is coming. And when you go over, do you do it through an agent? Or do you end up I have an agent it? over there. You have an agent over there? Yeah, he's yeah. kind of a rapscallion. He's but, a character. Right. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Most agents are, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Irish. Yeah. No, he's English. Uh, but English he lives in Ireland. He lives in Ireland, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. His wife runs a cat sanctuary. Really? But, wow. And we have, Barry has wonderful bandmates in Paris, too. I do. That's and great. So we played in Paris a few times. Yep. So when you when you travel over there, do you have a rhythm section with you? Uh, either the English one or the French one, mm -hmm. I'd say. Or when we were in Ireland, it was a duet. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, that's and pretty cool that you have the choice. The act is part of it. Yes, yeah, that's <laughs> cool you have the choice, you know, yeah. do either one. And have you, did you just say you did some recordings? Yes, yeah, so I'm working on recording you? now. Mm -hmm. um, it's been ongoing for a while. I started it a while back, several years back with Tony Saunders. And we passed the baton over to several different other engineers in studios where we've been working with Roy Blumenthal on drums. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And Roy's part of the dinosaurs, right? Uh, no, he's no. part of the Barry Mountain Band. Oh, okay. He's part of your band. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Spencer was in That's class. right. Spencer, yeah. So that should be finished sometime in the new year. Good. Before we head back over the Yes. Way, give me that look, Barry. Yeah. 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 I was gonna and say push up the schedule. We have some offers, hopefully. We what's what's the what's degrees. the longest tour you guys do? Do you do you go over for a couple weeks? Or? Well, I'm all, I always base myself in Paris because it's kind of central. Right. You can go to England easily from Paris and you can go to the continent. I mean, Amsterdam is just a train right away. Right. Uh, you do a lot of stuff by train or car? Well, you know, whatever turns out to be convenient. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this this last time, I went to Greece, and they threw oh, a party that was for amazing. me. Really? It was a Barry Melton tribute night. Tribute. Oh, oh I saw it. Barry. And they had and they three bands. Yeah. One of which played definitive early country John the Fish. Oh, that's great. That's, Very good. That's actually. amazing. Yeah. They didn't just play it, they studied it. That's great. Yeah. 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 Did they do Section 43? No. <laughs> yeah. no. That's one of the harder songs to pull off, I would think. Yeah. Have you ever heard anybody do it? No. Oh, I wait. Uh, Sausalito Slim does sort of yeah. like, I mean, he, I've heard him do it. By himself on uh -huh. the guitar. He studied Barry yeah. quite a bit. Did he? Yes. Yeah. Why? I have no idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're a psychedelic icon. That's yeah, why. Oh, is that it? Yeah. How would you describe psychedelia? That's what I want to know. Hmm. Well, you know. Because you guys are really, I mean, in a lot of ways, all these bands we're talking about, you guys were kind of the. The uh, the people that really came up with this music, yeah, yeah. 
well, yeah, and the charlatans, and uh, uh, and sup with camel. Actually, I mean, Peter Kramer just sat in with us in Virginia City. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, we, the, and they shouldn't be forgotten because they were the first San Francisco band that had a hit. The sup with camel. Yeah. What was their big hit again? Uh, hello, hello. Would you like some of my tangerine? Oh, yeah. You know, I'll never treat you mean. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So that's interesting. So they were one of the first. Yeah, well, Peter, actually, I didn't know this until the last time we were there, but he was actually born in Virginia City, and his dad and mom were from oh. Virginia City. Crazy. Now, have you played the Red Dog? Yeah, I just, just played did. it. You just played it. What was that like? Birthday party for the promoter. Yeah, for my um, friend Gary Schmidt. Gary Schmidt owned a two, couple of clubs in the Bay Area, and went, well, he owned the uh, Odyssey Room in Sunnyvale, mm -hmm. and he also owned the Reindeer Lodge up in uh, Mount Rose. At Mount Rose. Okay. Uh, and he just had his 80th birthday party at uh, the Red Dog. Wow. And we, you know, me and Peter. Banana. Banana. Davey. David. What was that like? Roy. It was excellent. Was it? Yeah. You get a good Virginia crowd when you play wonderful. there? Well, it, 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 was it wasn't open thing. to the public. It oh, okay. It was a private deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do they ever still do gigs there? I mean, like actual yeah, band I, gigs? Yeah, I think they yeah, do. They yeah. Do, yeah. do they? Yeah. Okay. This was outside. They have a little outside area in the oh, back. Oh, how fun. They, they were having open mic night inside. Do you remember the first time you ever played there? A long time ago. So you played there in the 60s? You know, I'm not sure. I know I played there in the 80s. Mm -hmm. John's friend, Mark Yanovsky, is still in the place. Yep. That's was he the original had, owner? Yeah. Oh, okay. Mark uh, was also one of the great... There. Pornographic lyricists of, <laughs> of San Francisco music. <laughs> That's great. And John, of course, knew his entire repertoire. Right. He was quite the songwriter. Yeah. And guitar player. I think he co-wrote some stuff with Starship. Well, Mark. Well, I better wrap this up because I got to go uh, to. Santa Rosa right now, but man, I want to thank you so much. Oh, no problem. Barry and Natalie. Oh, thanks, Mark. It's great to great to talk with both of you. And uh this was really fun, man. We may have spent too much time in the sixties. Well, you know now. what? That's the whole point of these. People, yeah. <laughs> people still want to hear about it. People it's do just, want to hear about it because the thing at the shows yeah. is like they want to hear stories too. Yeah. Like Absolutely. when we were in the UK, when we were in Ireland, we played the community center. They were very intently listening to Barry's stories. I bet. That was a big part of what well, we yeah. came for. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you were one of the people that got to experience that, what, two years or whatever? Three. That three was, years. Yeah, three 66, years. 66, 67, 68, maybe 69. Right, right. But by that time, by 69, we were international right. stars. or something. Kind of a different deal. It, yeah. it was. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we yeah. were pros. Right. By that time. Right. I mean, we were professional. We were definitely not professional in 1960. There was probably something very exciting about that period, about not they being a professional. Right? Thank you very much.